All right. Good morning and welcome to the New Zealand Initiatives webinar on central banking, bank independence and balance on that independence. I'm Eric Crampton, Chief Economist with the Initiative. Traditionally, central bank independence rested on a, a simple bargain. Politicians recognized that they would always be tempted to use monetary policy towards political ends and that the use of monetary policy in that kind of way worked to the longer run detriment of the country. So central banks are provided simple mandates to target inflation and the independence to do the job. In exchange, central banks would stick to their knitting and not stray into other areas. Monetary policy would be dedicated to its appropriate ends and prudential regulation would aim to maintain the stability of the financial system. Central banks have been extending that prudential remit substantially over the past decade. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand has been taking an increasingly active watch over risks to the financial system that it sees emerging from climate change. In late October, the bank released a report, Climate Change 2021 and Beyond, outlining the risks that it sees. The report described the bank's own emissions profile and the actions that the bank is taking to reduce emissions without mentioning the emissions trading scheme or the consequences of its binding cap. In short, if the bank reduces its own emissions, somebody else just buys the credits instead. But more importantly, the bank issued a strongly worded, but we, we viewed it as a threat to participants of the banking system that it regulates. The bank wrote, and I'll quote, we will promote banking sector climate change capabilities by increasing supervisory intensity on entities that are not positively progressing their climate change capabilities. And just this morning, the bank issued a media release explaining how it is supporting the external review board's work on climate related disclosures. It also noted its submission on the Ministry for the Environment's emissions reduction plan and the failures that the bank sees in access to green capital. In the bank's view, investors and asset managers with huge portfolios at stake simply don't understand opportunities and risks around climate related investment. That seems odd. They've got a lot of skin in the game. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand is hardly alone in taking this tack, though. The bank counts itself among some hundred central banks and financial supervisors who are part of the network for greening the financial system. But while evidence for, of climate change is rock solid, evidence that it provides risks to the financial system has been really hard to find, both here and abroad. And that evidence would really be needed to justify hardline prudential regulation. Without it, banks may be sharply overstepping into areas that are really the prerogative of parliaments and legislatures. When banks take on a political role, their independence may ultimately be at risk. With us today, we have John Cochran. John is the Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Prior to Hoover, he was Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago. John's academic work straddles finance and macroeconomics. His work explores the implications of reserve banks paying interest on reserves, the implications of multiple equilibria and new Keynesian models when interest rates hit the zero bound, technical work measuring the persistence of economic fluctuations and the output response to monetary shocks, and perhaps relevantly here, difficulties in cost benefit assessment of financial market regulation. His work is published in the top journals our discipline has to offer, but you can also read him at his blog, The Grumpy Economist. It's really accessible and a great read. Um, yeah. John is also no stranger to New Zealand. He provided the Condon Memorial Lecture at Canterbury University in 2012 when I was on faculty over there. His talk was on sovereign debt. He's also a fan of sw swooping around in gliders over at Omarama, and closed borders are a bit of a hindrance on that. But all of it makes him ex exceptionally well-placed to help us understand what's going on here and the risk that it presents. Please get your questions through to us on Slido. The access code is 024262, but it also should have been in the invite for the sessions and we'll see if we can get it up in the window as well here. I'll shut up, I'll let John take over. We'll have a bit of time for discussion at the end. Take it away, John. Uh, thanks, that was a very kind introduction. Um, let me, uh, I think once you say climate, then blah, everything goes nuts and, and a bar fight breaks out. So. Let's uh, try to narrow the issue uh, to what we can productively talk about today. Uh, so, so first disclaimer, my expertise is on the US. I don't really know what's going on in New Zealand. I would love to come visit and find out, but that's not happening these days. Um, but uh, I think uh, as, as we discussed, a lot of it applies because a lot of it's going on the same in the world. Um, and so also to focus discussion, we're not gonna talk today about climate change. Uh, climate change is important. And I do not want to disagree one iota with anything in any IPCC report, especially the actual graphs and charts, uh, and, and less so the fluff on, on the front. So we will not discuss whether climate change is real or not. Yes, it's real. Take everything in those reports for given. 
I also don't think it's productive for us to discuss climate policy. What is the right thing for our governments to do uh, about climate change? Uh, in fact, I will not uh, even argue one branch of climate policy is to uh, shut down fossil fuels uh, and subsidize electric cars and windmills. That's the most popular one right now. We're not going to discuss if that's a good idea, uh, as opposed to, for example, um, an emphasis on nuclear carbon capture and storage, heaven forbid geoengineering, if it's really a disaster, or all the other things that are out there. In fact, I don't want to even argue about whether it's a good idea for our societies to use the financial system if they wish to shut down fossil fuels and to subsidize uh, alternatives, uh, uh, which is one, one way to do it as opposed to legislation. If our duly elected parliaments, uh, congresses, administrations uh, willing to stand for re-election on it want to do that, do those policies that way, more power to them. Well, maybe not, but that's a discussion for another day. What we're here to discuss is uh, financial regulation and central banks, whether uh, in the absence of such a clear, unequivocal, and politically accountable mandate from our legislatures and administrations, uh, central banks and financial regulators should take the lead uh, on a bunch of policies which whose end purpose is more and more explicitly uh, to implement that particular kind of financial policy, namely, uh, defunding um, fossil fuel development and subsidizing today's uh, popular alternatives. In the US, it's, it's owner, it's privately owned electric cars, uh, windmills and solar panels, uh, but you know, those things change uh, quickly. So should central banks take this on? Now, central banks uh, used to at least loudly say, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're just uh, dealing with cl uh, climate risk, the financial system but more and more they're willing to just say up front, no, 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 we're taking the lead. The climate's a disaster. We have to do something about it. No one else is moving. Um, now, uh, this has been at least uh, until that recent refreshing uh, bit of honesty uh, um, cloaked in the idea of climate risk to the financial system. No, 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 say central banks and financial regulators. We're not taking it upon ourselves to do climate change policy. That would be terrible because central banks have limited mandates. And central banks have limited mandates for very, very good reasons. Uh, in the US, uh, right now, we have a party in power who wants a robust climate policy. Two years ago, we had a party in power who thought that immigration was a national crisis and uh, something was, and, uh, and the legislature was not moving fast enough to do something about it and left to its own devices would have said, Federal Reserve, go out there and throw anyone out of the financial system who is hiring an illegal alien and subsidize the construction of this border wall, which is underpriced in financial markets. Yes, politicians can do that. That is the reason why central bankers are supposed to be politically independent and at least wait for moves like that to make it through enabling legislation with a clear support, uh, democratic support. So that's why central banks are supposed to only watch financial risks. And that's why we were talking not about central banks directly leading the charge on climate change, which they're not supposed to do, but central banks uh, uh, addressing climate financial risk. So what is climate financial risk? The, the idea here is central banks only interested in money, only interested in financial affairs, opened the box and said, where are the risks? Oh, climate is the big risk. We must do something about climate. When you look at that, it is a patently false. Now, let me just parse these words in simple, straightforward English. Heaven forbid we actually use the straightforward English language. What is a risk to the financial system? A risk to the financial system doesn't mean that somebody somewhere might lose money on some stocks that they bought. A risk to the financial system is supposed to be uh, an event like 2008, a systemic run, a time when there's a big shock to the economy, blows through equity and debt, uh, long-term debt cushions, sparks a run and shuts down the banking and, and financial system. That's bad. That's what central banks and financial regulators are supposed to stop. So that's what financial system stability should mean. Climate risk, well, what does that mean? Well, the, the natural meaning, English meaning of the word is that something might change in the climate unexpectedly, dramatically, so as to cause a financial crisis in the kind of horizon we can begin to talk about regulation. We can't regulate for risks 100 years from now because those loans haven't been made yet. We don't know what 100 years from now is going to look like. We regulate in the couple of years uh, and we regulate the assets that banks have today 
on their balance sheets. So could the climate change so dramatically as to blow through equity and debt cushions and cause a, uh, and, and cause a systemic run in our financial system? Not in a million years. And I'm just, I'm not, just read the IPCC reports. This kind of event, the sea level is gonna rise, yep, about two millimeters a year. There will be floods and hurricanes and, and extreme weather events, yep, as there have always been. The, the probability distribution of that is not gonna change by factors of 100 to 1,000 in the next five years. And our economies, our financial systems are remarkably resilient to weather. A very courageous report from the New York Fed just came out examining what happened to banks in the wake of hurricanes in Florida. Guess what? They made money <laughs> because you make money uh, servicing loans to people who are rebuilding houses. Uh, we are just not very, our economies are not very uh, weather dependent. People in the US are moving from New Hampshire to Texas, not the other way around and Florida and all these other places. I gather Nancy Pelosi just bought a house right on the coast in Florida. Uh, so th those movements, those are orders of magnitude, bigger weather changes than climate change is gonna make us. So clearly climate risk to the financial system uh, is, is, a, is an invention. Uh, and in fact, it, it's, a, uh, it's a dangerous one. Uh, if, the, if central banks honestly opened Pandora's box and said, what are the risks to the financial system? Let's think about what they came up with. This is it's an interesting case of putting the, the cart before the horse. If you frame the question as what are the climate risks to the financial system, you can come up with all sorts of maze and coulds and mites and sordos. But if you ask what are the risks to the financial system that we should be paying attention to, and we haven't, by the way, our central banks just missed a mortgage crisis, and then they just missed a pandemic, and then they just missed inflation. So their, their record of opening Pandora's box and looking in is not particularly good. But should they do that, which would be a great idea, what are the out of the box risks you're not thinking about? Well, hmm, what if China invades Taiwan? Hello, New Zealand, how's your economy gonna look if China invades Taiwan and your financial system? And there's a blockade of all trade in the Pacific. That looks to me like a pretty big risk to the financial system that will happen in the next, that could happen in the next five years. Uh, what if there's a, a nuclear war somewhere? What if there's another pandemic, a real one, one like our ancestors faced where 30% of the people die? Uh, what if there's a if the Middle East blows up? There's all sorts of big out of the box risks there we should be looking at. Climate, read the IPCC reports. It's just not even on that list in the next five years or so. The financial regulation can do something. This is clearly a subterfuge. This is clearly a made up risk in order to uh, go uh, go around your mandated limit that you're not supposed to take charge of climate change, no matter how popular you look at Davos. If you do that. Well, uh, people who, who, who do this stuff are, then they'll be a little more honest. Well, 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 it's not really, yes, I know. <laughs> the web, there's not gonna be a weather shock in the next five years and any conceivable change in climate that's gonna wipe out our financial system. But what about transition risk? What about the oil companies who are gonna be out of business uh, and, and uh, that could cause financial problems? Uh, that's, an, that's a more, I, if I would like it if we were more honest and called that climate policy risk. There too, if we were to uh, if we were to be even handed about it and say, hmm, why don't we look at all of the policy risks, all the things regulators might do to shut down businesses? That would be a very interesting set of disclosures. Now it is. Uh, I'm pretty cynical about regulators. The idea that our environmental regulators are so dumb that they will pass regulations that will not just bankrupt whole industries, but will do so in a way to bring about a systemic financial crisis. Even I don't think they're that dumb, <laughs> uh, but possibly we could at least talk about it. But this is not a problem. Dying industries, slow transitions have never caused financial problems as there has never been a financial crisis from a weather event. Uh, the 1920s, when, when there was a stock market crash, it, it, it wasn't the horse and buggy industry that crashed. It was the radio and GM and Ford. In 1999, when, when, Web one, when there was another stock market crash, it wasn't the typewriter industry that went down. It was the overambitious computer industry. What's risky today? If we were honestly gonna look at financial risk today, let's see, hmm. uh, Exxon, 230 billion valuation, or Tesla, a trillion dollars of equity valuation and not much product. Revan, the electric car, uh, truck company, $83 billion and they've sold 153 trucks. If you, want, if you want to look at the history of where is their financial risk, the financial risk is in the new up and coming industries that are lots of 
future promises and highly subsidized by central banks and encouraged by governments. See mortgages, United States 2006. That's where your financial risks are. And even so, those aren't risks because they're financed by equity, not by debt. Uh, I looked at Exxon's balance sheet. Exxon's balance sheet is it's 200, uh, $230 billion worth of assets, almost all of that long-term debt and common stock, $18 billion worth of debt. That's nothing. <laughs> uh, Exxon should get a gold star for financial stability. Financial stability. Why? Because it can't, it's not borrowing money. And you can't, if you haven't borrowed money, you can't welch on your debt. You can't cause a financial crisis. So even, uh, even transition risk is just uh, patently absurd when you look at it. So what is this? You saw what it is. It's an effort to get around the clear limited mandate. Why am I getting grumpy about this? Because I care about the climate. This is terrible climate policy. This kind of climate policy will enshrine things. Central banks have no expertise in figuring out what good climate policy is. And one thing we know for sure, whatever, whatever ends up solving the climate problem, it'll be not be what we're thinking about today. It may well be nuclear power. It may, it, it may be well be carbon capture and storage, all the things that we're not subsidizing today. Central banks can't figure out which technologies to subsidize today and who to drive out of the financial system. It will politicize central bank. These are political issues. Now, a lot of people spend too much time in the Davos circles and think every good person in the world thinks this. No, these are intensely political issues. All I don't know how New Zealand is. All the rest of our countries are very polarized and right on the edge. And you don't get, you to solve climate, you need a durable policy, one that lasts 100 years. You don't get durable policy out of a out of very thin electoral majorities, Congress not willing to move, and then shoving the policy down people's throats by regulatory means. What you get is losing an election and then all heck breaks loose and, and you don't get durable, effective climate policy out of it. And you don't get financial regulation and policy out of it. I'm very worried about all of the other things I mentioned for financial stability. Let's add sovereign debt to the list. What happens if there's a sovereign debt crisis in the US? That could happen. Good luck, New Zealand, when that happens. You ought to be paying attention to that. <laughs> uh, and if you cook the books for climate change, if everybody in the financial regulation department is busy trying to come up with some excuse to say we have a climate risk to justify a climate policy, they're not paying attention to their exposures to the genuine risk, which we all have. So we need good climate policy. This won't be the way to get it. We need good, durable, science-based climate policy, policy. And we good, need good financial regulation and somebody paying attention to, uh, to inflation. I know it's not sexy but uh, central banks should get back to the business of what they're supposed to be doing uh, and not play climate star. Okay, enough for my comments, let's go. Excellent, and I'll just shift the view back. Excellent, there we are. I'm not used to being a Zoom host, so apologies for that. Great talk, thank you, John. There's a few questions coming through from Slido, but I'll open up with one just for me, for me host prerogative. What if New Zealand is just different, right? So I'm not sure if there's anywhere else in the world where uh, Reserve Bank monetary policy statements will wind up citing dairy prices as part of its uh, outlook for the overall economy. So they'll be citing what the futures options are looking like on dairy. Maybe it's just different here that if banks have a lot of uh, agricultural debt and that is subject to not just climate risk, but also climate regulation risk, eventually we're gonna be having um, pricing on agricultural emissions that is coming in. Is, is it possible that, or possible or likely that banks are just kind of dumb and going, well, we're just gonna keep lending money to the agricultural sector and have really high, highly leveraged dairy farms that'll all, all, all go bankrupt. Um, if they face any serious price on methane emissions, therefore central bank has to come in and hold their hand through all of this. Now, to me, it seems a little unlikely and a bit of a stretch and at least would be something that they'd have to demonstrate and prove, but is it conceivable that this is really a big problem? Anything's conceivable. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, uh, of all the risks, agriculture is an extremely risky business as oil is an extremely risky business. The idea, the people who run oil companies haven't thought about what if the price of oil goes down is just ridiculous because like it was negative two years ago. <laughs> uh, the same thing is true. Now, I, I would push this, you know, people who are uh, in New Zealand, if you're going to put in a methane emissions cap, 
uh, are the people who put in the methane emissions gap going to think do a little bit of cost benefit analysis and say, oh dear, we might you know put the entire agriculture sector of New Zealand out of business? Uh, that, that, I can't imagine that they are that incompetent that they would not think of doing so. Uh, if you're worried about bank risks, by the way, the number one answer is equity. So I'm all for lots and lots of equity. There's two approaches. If you do think there's a bank risk, one approach is, well, we'll send out our team of experts and we will gauge exactly which investments are going to fall $32.50 to $37.22 if there's a methane cap. Or you just say, banks, there's all these out of the box risks. We don't know what happened. Why don't you go fund yourself with a lot more equity and a lot less short-term debt? But <laughs> why don't we do that? Well, because then the regulator doesn't get to go in there and tell the banks what to invest in and what not to invest in. I must also say, I praise New Zealand. Uh, it's very nice of you. You're, you're a very small country, one gazillionth of world carbon emissions. The climate issue is, is coal-fired power plants in China and India, full stop. Uh, so if you think that the way to, to save your agricultural industry is by New Zealand cutting down on carbon, uh, just the cause and effect there is a total flight of fancy. Thank you. And I'll note as well that the Reserve Bank has been increasing bank capitalization requirements, and that was coming in ahead of the pandemic. So that was, a, that was a little fraught, but um, it's, it's interesting that they're combining a push on bank capitalization with a push on the specific area. Let's have a look over at Slido. Uh, first question that I'm looking at from Henry Fitzgerald, couldn't, this, couldn't the climate transition trigger wild swings in asset prices as we've re recently seen with natural gas? Couldn't this pose a significant financial risk? Now, the New Zealand context here is that um, the incoming Labour government basically banned the oil and gas sector in New Zealand in 2017. Uh, they stopped exploration permits off the coast of Taranaki, and that had substantial effects. Um Oil and gas industries are financed by equity. Why? Because everybody knows that the price of oil and gas fluctuates wildly. Uh, the fraction of price of oil and gas price fluctuations that is due to climate change, which is remember climate change is a slow inexorable process, right? Uh, next to nothing. Climate policy, maybe policymakers can do all sorts of crazy things, but then they change their minds. Um, my president, uh, President Biden, first day in office canceled the Keystone pipeline. Practically second day in office, he started begging Saudi Arabia and Russia to turn on the pumps. Why? Because gas prices went up. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you pass something that um, has an enormous effect, either on gas prices your citizens are, are, are going to pay, or wipes out the oil and gas, threatens to wipe out the oil and gas industry, I'm, I have a sense that your legislators are going to hear about this and, and not let that happen. Cool. I'll go down to the bottom of the list. We've got one from Will Miller here, and I'll, I'll just reinterpret it a little bit. So he's asking, kind of in the context of our emissions trading scheme, um, can you imagine there being any substantial market failures around, like you could either have a really well-functioning carbon tax or a well-functioning emissions trading scheme. Either one will give you reasonably equivalent results. Would there be other market failures that might come in that would justify a central bank coming in and layering on additional rules around this to either smooth the transition or make a carbon tax work better or make an emissions trading scheme work better? Is there potentially a role for a reserve bank here? Um, you can imagine all sorts of market failures. Get three bills yeah. into an economist and our job is to come up with 350 market failures that can justify any policy action you want. The question is, can you imagine the competence in a central bank to exactly and precisely offset some vaguely alleged market failure that nobody's actually documented or figures out how it works? Probably not. Cool. I'll bundle a few of these here together. So there's a few of them that are looking at uh, whether this is a power grab for central bankers, what should be done about it, if so. And... To me, that then also wraps in with the question around central bank independence and why it matters. So these are kind of three separate questions that I'm tying in together. I've seen all of this as a threat to bank independence because they're getting into matters that are fundamentally political. But where you and I might understand why that might be a risk, what's the big deal with central bank independence? Why, is it, why does it matter that this be preserved and that we don't wind up with changes in government resulting in, I don't know, firing the central bank governors for having strayed too broadly into other areas? 
Yeah, this is um, uh, this is this is part of a theme. Uh, starting in 2008, central banks have done more and more and more and more. Uh, and uh, nobody likes central bank independence. Certainly, the power party in power doesn't like central bank independence. They want uh, the the famous uh, what was his name the, the, the famous bank robber in the U.S. said, uh, "Why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is." Uh, <laughs> and now that central banks have the power, have shown themselves with the power to print up all sorts of money and hand it out, and to subsidize to buy all sorts of assets to subsidize all sorts of lending. How delightful! Send that my way. Um, we had, we used to have central bank independence for the same reason we had judicial independence, uh, because we think it's important to have technocratic institutions that have great, great power. A central bank can do enormous things uh, to, for good or evil, uh, but um, we don't want them used lightly uh, by, by the party in power uh, too much. And we don't want them, uh, we don't want the bankers to run off with whatever their policy prescriptions are. So you get great power uh, and great independence in return for obeying a limited mandate. And uh, you know wh why do we bother having a Supreme Court? Why not just have everything go before the legislature? Well, uh, we've discovered that stable institutions uh, are, are a good idea, not simple majoritarian, 51% of the vote, and then you take in charge of the printing press and send it to your buddies. Uh, that's falling by the wayside, uh, and I think this is part of that. Uh, this is part of that, and uh, unfortunately, what it just what it means is you don't get durable policies. Uh, when, uh, when when the deplorables in the U.S. and the Gijon in France, and I don't know what you call them in New Zealand, get mad about gas prices, they vote in somebody you don't like, and then they take over the central bank and reverse all of those policies. And, and start you know, subsidizing border walls and, and kicking out of the banking system people who hire immigrants or whatever it's gonna be. Top question currently on Slido. As more and more companies now focus on climate change, racism, identity politics, how can central banks not get sucked into the politicization of everything? We've kind of seen this in, in the ECB and I've seen that you've had some critique of how the ECB has been approaching uh, climate risk in particular. Here, the Reserve Bank seems to be taking it on a more expansive role, hitting into some of these areas as well. Is there, is there any structural change that can uh, insulate against this? Oh, well, um, Nancy Reagan had some advice, just say no. <laughs> uh, you, you are allowed to say, look, that's not my mandate and it would be nice. And if I signed on to this, I know I know my own career would would take off, and my chances for something political after I stop central banking is boring. <laughs> who, who wants to stay being a central banker? Uh, but central bankers can stiffen up and just say no. And of course, um, legislatures have to demand of them to say no, rather than oh, I can't wait till it's my chance to take power and, and do it. It's part of the increasing. Um, uh, you know, win an election and then shove everything you can down the other's throats. In the U.S., we increasingly rule not not by laws, not even by regulations, just by executive orders. And then we change parties every four years. And the first thing we do is erase all the old ones and throw in new ones. Uh, it's not a good uh, durable structure of government. But you know, the, uh, people have to want it, <laughs> and and the party in power has to recognize that if it if it violates all these norms, sooner or later it will be out of power and then the other party will do unto them like they did unto them. But hey, we're, this is, we're heading towards more political questions, which is, isn't really my, I love to spout off about everything because I'm a blogger now, um, but uh, I'm not very good at politics. <laughs> well, look, looking back to some of the other risks that you were talking about earlier that banks might be better uh, suited to look at going down through the list on Slido, um, First one that I'd seen was, are you worried about the potential global financial ramifications from the debt crisis in Evergrande and the Chinese residential sector? Is that something we should be worried about? It, should that be on Reserve Bank's agenda as well? Yeah, there's a good one. If you're looking at out of the box risks that are hard to model and what if, what if China kind of blows up internally rather than blowing up externally? Do we have any, uh, you know, all the talk about climate risk as well, then there's general equilibrium inter interrelations yeah. and effects. Well, I, I haven't, you know, if China kind of, China's credit markets blow up and then it has a big fall in GDP and, and gosh knows what sort of political ramifications, 
who's lent, you know, what, what's a financial crisis? Somebody somewhere borrowed a whole bunch of money they can't pay back and the accounting is all kind of messed up. China, <laughs> and, and how does that spill out to the rest of the world? I, I can see the same way viruses come out of China, I can see financial crises coming out of China. There's something I, I'd like to put a couple hundred economists, take them off of looking for climate risks among the sheep in New Zealand and, and send them to figure out what happens if China blows up. Another potential risk comes from the ba central banks themselves. So uh, top question currently, are you concerned central banks will use their QA and QE inflated balance sheets to turn themselves into de facto sovereign wealth funds? Yes. <laughs> no, not so much the QE. QE is relatively minor. Um, you know, it's just a change in maturity structure of sovereign debt. But what we, we crossed the Rubicon in 2008 and central banks started buying all sorts of other assets. That was something in, in the long run of history in, in this move towards central bank independence, one of the kind of limits was, look, you only buy treasury securities. Um, why do you not buy other stuff? Because if you look around all sorts of mismanaged parts of the world, the central bank is where the government goes to fund its cronies investments in, in rat holes. Um, and and we're, we're heading in that direction as well. And, and uh, our Congress has noticed, oh, the central, our central bank is buying up a bunch of mortgage-backed securities. Still, uh, you might think we're in a housing bubble or whatever, but nope, we're, we're still subsidizing uh, subsidizing mortgages. Well, if we can subsidize the mortgage industry, why not subsidize others? The European Central Bank is directly buying green bonds by its definition of green, subsidizing that industry. So, um, you know, once having tasted, uh, you know, once having tasted wine, whiskey comes next. And uh, it's, it's just inevitable that politicians will say, great, well, if you can buy that, and, you know, if you can buy windmill bonds and electric car bonds, and how about redevelopment bonds in my neighborhood? And then we go back to, to where many highly inflationary central banks came from. There winds up also being a related problem, or at least as we see it here, um, the bank has taken on a whole pile of assets and government paper here. Were the central bank to start unwinding some of that and needing to, if it were starting to need to increase interest rates, there is going to wind up being uh, asset price risk that it will have to realize a loss on unwinding some of this. And it's got an indemnity from the treasury here. So at least the central bank won't be losing money on it, but there will be balance sheet risk then for central government. And that starts introducing some interesting potential political dynamics that I well, that worry me a little bit. I don't know if this is the kind of thing that worries you as well. Well, let's leave aside the, the political dynamics. Central banks and treasuries are part of a unified bank balance sheet. So when a central bank buys, say, uh, you know, an Air Crampton bond and subsidizes your new house, uh, that really is on the treasury balance sheet. And when you default on that mortgage, uh, sooner or later, one way or another, the taxpayers are paying for it, either with taxes or with inflation. Uh, and, and um, you know, that that's that's just a fact of, of where we're going here. It is, it is subsidized finance, yep. Top question currently, can a politicized prudential regulation regime coexist with monetary policy independence? I guess that gets to something that's fundamental, right? They've got strict independence in monetary policy because there's no way you want politicians deciding on what monetary policy should be. You get into Nixon pressuring Burns and all of those issues that we've gone through before. How much of that leaks over from prudential regulation? So if banks start, do, central banks start doing highly politicized things in prudential regulation, using that mandate to affect political aims rather than anything that's really justifiably uh, tied to prudential regulation, does that end up threatening monetary policy independence as well? So I, I don't see the current world as one in which monetary policy decisions are that much more independent than regulatory uh, uh, decisions um, because central bankers like to keep their jobs. Uh, <laughs> you know, Trump was, was already really leaning hard on Powell to keep interest rates low uh, and that pressure was there. Um, uh, the, the, the pressure to keep, you know, Powell wanted to keep his job and uh, I don't think it, you know, our, our Fed's pretty good about um, bending to the wind of, of what Congress wants um, on, on all of these. You know, Powell started saying, no, we don't do climate. He was, he was really courageous. About a year ago, he was writing, nope, central bank's mandate is no climate. Well, now we have a commission to study maybe we're going to do climate. Um, and, and so I, 
Uh, I, I would look for interest rate rises. We'll, we'll see. A test of this will be whether interest rates firmly stuck at zero in the United States, despite enormous amounts of inflation, whether the day after Powell is, uh, is confirmed, whether we start to see a little more action on interest rates going up. Uh, Excellent. There's a couple of questions that are tied together here as well. Were you cheered by Joe Biden's renomination of Powell as a sign that the Fed may not be entirely subse subject to polarization and politicization? And uh, from our perspective here in New Zealand, what does the reappointment of Powell and the new appointment of Vice Chair Brainerd mean for the financial system? Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't like talking about personalities that much. Uh, you know, my, I, I have met Powell and he's a really smart guy <laughs> and uh, understands, uh, he understands technical monetary policy. I was very impressed with how much he understands it. In, in fact, to the point of, of knowing where the bodies are buried. Um, the, the equations of new Keynesian models contain some body. Powell knew where a lot of the bodies were buried, which I thought was very impressive. But this is a political game, and uh, you know, um, uh, Brainerd has has been yeah, here. This is personality. Just read her speeches. She's big on climate, and a lot of the other um, uh, the regional bank presidents have really staked their careers on we're going on to inequality and racial justice and, and issues like that. Uh, so that that kind of stuff is heading into the Fed, and we'll see. Um, as we think about people being reappointed at our Fed think more about these regulatory issues than interest rates. Interest rates, everyone within the Fed kind of goes in the same direction on interest rates. Um, but you know, this, this was the Powell Brainerd thing. They, they all had kind of agreed on interest rates, but, but Brainerd's much more on the, on the regulatory side. That's, the Fed is 99% regulation now and only 1% interest rates. And where that regulation goes is, is the interesting thing. Now, you know, what, what was, why wasn't Larry Summers <laughs> in there? We had, Wait, look, this inflation was a, a tremendous institutional failure of the Fed. Uh, nobody saw this inflation coming. Well, I didn't see this inflation coming either, but I don't have 2,000 PhD economists on staff, and it isn't my number one mandate to figure out where's the supply and is there too much demand and is inflation coming? But they completely blew it. Um, so, so uh, you know, Summers was the one guy who actually saw it coming. You, you would sort of think that after an army loses a battle because it didn't forecast the enemy invading, that that uh, you know might want to change forces. But they didn't. They, you know, Summers is politically out for all sorts of reasons. Um, so anyway, they they went with they went with the middle of the road. They didn't want to stir things up before an election. Uh, you know, the main message is continuity. Things are going to keep going as pretty much it would have been had Brainerd been appointed uh, as well continuity in kind of the wrong direction, if, if you want to ask me. I've had this, you know, expanded uh, regulatory role and 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 um, not, not standing up hard and saying, absolutely no, this institution is not going here, even if you, Congress, want it, and I don't care if I lose my job over that. I was struck by your comment on expertise within the bank. When the Reserve Bank set its new Monetary Policy Committee, um, I understand that one of the criteria that they had in deciding who should be on it was that they didn't want anybody who had conflicts. And one of the things that they viewed as a conflict was an ongoing research interest in uh, monetary economics. Um, now, okay, your reaction tells me that I'm not crazy in thinking that's absolutely stupid. Um, <laughs> It is desirable for there to be a few specialists in monetary policy on a monetary policy committee and not just kind of generalist economists, or am I nuts? Well, I think overall in, in government, we've gone way too far on worrying about tiny ephemeral potential conflicts of interest and, and not looking for people who are uh, ethical, honest, and, and competent. Um, you know, the same thing is, is true. Our, our Supreme Court justices, uh, it's very hard for them to have actually written an opinion about anything and still get elected to the Supreme Court. Um, so, um, you know, any, uh, anybody with ongoing research is going to have, only people with ongoing research know what's going on. So uh, they're going to have, a, they're gonna have a, a whole bunch of, you mind my blog, you find all sorts of crazy things that I've said over the years. Uh, so, you know, that, that would disqualify me from ever working these things. So that, I think that's the part of the more general thing. It's hard to get qualified people or and, and bankers. You know, it would be nice to have some people who know how financial markets work operating, but you know, now bankers are conflicted uh, too. Uh, so I, I think in general, um, 
paying attention to tiny ephemeral conflicts of interest as opposed to trying to get qualified, competent people to, to work in these government institutions has, has been a, a difficulty. Cool. Uh, there's some questions that have been coming up in the chat window as well as the uh, Slido window, and one here from Prasanna Guy. In most cases, central bank economists and their governors are well-trained in good economics, New Zealand accepted. Uh, even the BIS and Patrick Bolton are writing about green swans. Yellen, Bolton, et al. are surely aware of what you rightly say. So what is making them buy into this charade? Which charade are we, which of the many charades? Are we? <laughs> um, focusing on climate risk as a prudential regulatory matter when there seems to be no basis for considering it to be a threat to the financial system. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know Janet Yellen as well, and she's a wonderful, uh, as of January 20th, she was, I knew her to be a very good economist and a very, not just good economist, but judicious economist, but she signed on to this whole of government approach to, to climate um, that clearly doesn't respect scientific fact. And, and what's going on there? You know, why do people in an administration, you know, what they say publicly and what they say privately may be different. So, I, you know, speculating on why people are doing what they're doing, I think is, is a bad idea. We, there is a, let's look at the larger level of the institutions. That's where this institution is going and, and um, needs to stop. Top question now on uh, Slido, can the Euro survive the ECB's activism or ask differently, is the ECB able to tighten when Italy's banking system and public finances depend on cheap money? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think of the many dangers of this direction, I think the Euro is one of the big ones. I mean, let's take the, the climate question, then we'll get to the Italy question, the still unresolved question uh, of, at the foundation of the Euro. Um, the climate question, so as I have posed it, what's going on is the, the, uh, the Gilets Jaunes in France are not gonna go for a this climate policy elected in, 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 in legislation. The climate policy of uh, defunding fossil fuels, rapidly increasing the price of, of fossil fuels, um, electricity that comes on and off because we don't have alternatives and, and massive subsidies for, for windmills in the, in the dark, calm <laughs> winter of, of Germany, and, and, which leads to buying it from, from Russia and Czech. So they're not gonna go for that. So the ECB is all far ahead of the rest of us uh, doing this by regulatory subterfuge. What happens when those voters in, in France, Italy, Poland, uh, Hungary find out what's going on. Well, what happened when the voters in the UK found out what was going on in Brussels? Uh, I think this poses a deep risk that this strategy of we don't trust, it's a very undemocratic. We do not trust democracy. We do not, we do not want to wait for uh, a durable majority to say, yes, we want these climate policies and willing to go. So we're gonna stuff them down your throats. And then uh, if you believe the climate rhetoric that the earth is about to fry, that justifies eco-authoritarianism. Well, seize power, shove it down their throats because we got to save the planet. Uh, that, that catastrophism is scientifically invalid, but that's kind of what's going on. And this European Central Bank is shoving it down their throats. Now, uh, we'll see. Uh, if they don't like it, um, that, could re that could lead to more countries leaving Europe. Uh, that could lead to more countries leaving the, the, uh, the, the um, euro, which is too bad because the euro is a wonderful invention. And you mentioned that the, uh, we, we, before we even get to climate policy, there's this unresolved issue. Uh, does the ECB print up money in order to bail out sovereigns should they threaten to default? In the instruction manual, written in both in French, German, and English, you just look it up right there. Das instructions, or is it their instructions? It says, no, we don't do that. Uh, sovereigns are like businesses, they default if they get into trouble. But of course, since whatever it takes, uh, the ECB is buying up sovereign debts like crazy. And should Italy default, it's on, it's on the, it's on the German taxpayer, and that is the fundamental structural problem. And you know, may, maybe China goes under and Italy goes under next, and then this is my nightmare scenario. Long before the oceans rise and the heavens and, and, and the sun comes out and heats things up, um, 
China could go blow up, Europe could blow up, uh, everyone sells their treasury bills, the US could blow up. Uh, that's, that's not something that's completely impossible. Yeah, the risk in the ECB worry our chair all over heart, which a lot too. Uh, a couple of tied questions have come up here. One asks, do you agree with Summers that this is not transitory inflation globally? And the other one I see is related. You've said that a 5% interest rate will be a $1 trillion hit on the US federal budget. Is high inflation or even hyperinflation possible here? Is, it, is there a safe exit that we can get from where we are? Um, boy, three questions at, at once. <laughs> well, we, we should take a, a hint from, from people who write climate risk uh, reports. Anything's possible. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, uh, high, high or hyperinflation is what would happen to our countries if there were a Greek style debt crisis. Um, you know, I don't know, we, one of two things happens, you default or you inflate, one of those two things happens. Uh, if, if people say, you know what, these people, these governments are not good for their debts, I'm getting out now, then, then you have, you know, so that, and that could happen. Uh, likely, I don't know. Uh, the 5% thing you mentioned, so, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna work back in time, the eventual huge thing that might happen 10 or 20 years from now. The, the point you mentioned, suppose our governments have some inflation and say, boy, we gotta redo 1980. And we got to raise interest rates a lot to, to do this inflation. Will they do that? Will our governments, if inflation breaks out, raise interest rates substantially, even at the risk of a big in, uh, recession, in order to contain inflation? I don't know if they will do it, but the uh, fiscal current fiscal situation makes it much harder to do it. If you need to raise interest rates 5%, just 5% in the US, I'll give you US numbers. We have 100% debt to GDP. Raising interest rates 5% means you need to come up with a trillion bucks a year of interest costs on the debt. Plus, you need to come up with more money to finance a windfall to bondholders because you're going to pay the bondholders back in much more uh, expensive dollars, uh, uh, much more valuable dollars. So uh, the, in 1980, we had 25% debt to GDP. Those fiscal requirements are four times bigger than they were in 1980. To stabilize inflation, you can't just raise interest rates. You gotta have a huge permanent uh, fiscal austerity as well. Will our governments do that? My government wants to spend 5% of GDP every year just on, on deficits. And the idea of a fiscal austerity program to contain inflation looks, looks like a flight of fancy. Is current inflation transitory? Uh, good question. <laughs> My bet is that our current inflation comes from, uh, what do we do? We printed up 20% of GDP and handed it out. It was a classic helicopter drop. Of course, you're going to get inflation, and you're going to get about 20% of GDP total inflation out of that. You've gotten about six cumulative, so uh, that stimulus, I figure, will go on for a while, as, as Larry Summers does. What happens after that depends on, uh, do we go back to normal fiscal and monetary policy, or uh, do is, is kind of the cat out of the bag? Uh, are people going to are going to people going to say, well, you inflated away 20% of my government debt, which is like the well, we just had a wealth tax, you know, already six percent, another ten percent coming. Uh, but I'll, I'm willing to lend the government more money to finance the more deficits as we go along. Or are people going to say, "Nah, I'm done with that"? Uh, well, uh, that we will. That is the question on which continuing inflation depends. And of course, does our, our Federal Reserve is pretty much announced they're going to follow the monetary policy that worked so well in the 1970s? That that's just what they, if you read their monetary policy strategy, it looks like the 1970s. So if they're gonna keep doing that too, well, then, then but that'll, so whether we get future inflation, you get a one-time price level boost out of a one-time helicopter drop. And then, uh, you know, we'll whether it keeps going uh, depends on future monetary fiscal policies and whether people have trust that our governments are going back to sane, sober, normal stuff. At least on the plus side for New Zealand, as at least as of a couple of months ago, there was no indication in the spread between covered and uncovered government securities that uh, people were pricing in ongoing big inflation risk. It and looked like it was still consistent. So our Good. interest rates are, are still very low. Now, interest rates did not forecast any of the inflation in the 1970s, and they did not forecast the disinflation in the 1980s. Go, go make a plot of interest rate uh, versus inflation. And you'll see that uh, interest rates have been terrible at forecasting where inflation goes. But uh, things would be worse <laughs> if, if interest rates have risen. And I got to say, New Zealand is a, I'm writing a textbook, and the inflation targeting move of the early 1990s was absolutely brilliant. 
Yep. Uh, I, I cannot think, you know, compared to the pain that the US went through in the 1980s to get rid of inflation, New Zealand just got rid of inflation kind of overnight. And it's just like a textbook on, on how to solve this problem. So if inflation does uh, break out in the US and in New Zealand over the next five to 10 years, I hope we will go back to New Zealand history and say, well, here's how to put that cat back in the bag, which is monetary policy, monetary independence, fiscal reform, and microeconomic reform all at, all at once. Well done, lads. And lads. <laughs> Question comes up on the chat window. Is there a role for the Reserve Bank Board, or I guess in the American context, the regional Fed's boards, to get more active and step up to protect central bank independence and also to keep uh, governors and Fed presidents or FOMC members focused on primary mandates and steer them away from other adventures? That could be their, their role. That's not their role now. Uh, in the US, the regional Feds are in fact the, the source of much mischief because of course, Regional Fed president is not a great job. I love you. The people who are doing it, my heart goes out to you. You're, you're doing wonderful work, but oh, I would not want that job. But many of them, you know, want, want to move on into better things. And, and you didn't move on into better things by really working on the mark to market rule on swap contracts or the deep nature of, uh, of monetary and fiscal policy rules. You know, these days in the US right now, Go look at the regional Fed websites. You'll see what they're concerned with: the climate change, inequality, racism. That 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 gets you uh, that gets you plotted. So the, the system of dispersed. Now our Fed, we're, we're so much uh, bigger than New Zealand. You, you maybe don't have the capacity to do this. Our Fed tends to be an echo chamber, where people just talk to each other all the time and can talk themselves into all sorts of crazy things. Uh, you know, you notice the language they use, where there's kind of buzzwords that I don't know what they mean. And so the, the, the regional feds as, as a separate place where different ideas come and bubble up and challenge orthodoxy has been really important in the past. And maybe I'm, I'm just being too grumpy. Uh, maybe in fact, they are playing their role now and the regional feds are challenging the orthodoxy that central banks shouldn't be involved with climate change and social issues and, and are going to lead the, lead the campaign to the Fed of uh, uh, 2025 when, when Central banks are are in charge of all that stuff. Well, that they're, that's the function, and they're still they're still exercising that function. Great. One of the other things that we've seen with um, more expansionary monetary policy is a lot of asset price inflation. There's been a couple of questions that have come up uh, here on that. So one of them from Robert Carling in Australia. He asks, "What do you think the monetary response should be to all of the asset price booms, particularly housing, that has come with?" Um, monetary responses to, I guess, earlier the GFC and now uh, COVID. And then similarly, a question from somebody calling themselves Satoshi in the Slido window. Do you think central banks should regulate away dysfunction in markets such as housing markets? If not, then to what extent should they get involved? Okay, too many questions. I have to, have to make a little note. Um, first of all, let's banish the words asset price inflation from our vocabulary. Uh, relative prices and inflation are two different things. And asset prices going up is a relative price change, not inflation is everything goes up at the same time. Prices, wages, assets, everything. Uh, something up going up relative to something else, that's a relative price, uh, not an asset price. Uh, let us also, so I think um, central banks, they, they, if you read what they say, they think of their power as immense and their understanding of linkages as immense. I, I've spent 40 years doing monetary policy and the link between the level of the short-term nominal interest rate and the risk premium on assets is everyone says it's there, but I don't know an economic model that says it's there or why. Why should you care whether you borrow at five and lend at six or borrow at one and lend at two for the premium of stocks over bonds? This shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. So. Um, uh, the, the idea that the central banks really are deeply in charge of that, I think, is, is vastly uh, overstated. Uh, it is true, low, low real interest rates mean high asset prices, but we got low real, central banks don't really control the level of real interest rates, sort of supply and demand savings and investment does that. I will say, though, that, that um, so direct interventions, I, I worry a little bit more about, and we have a put option. 
And it's not so much the put option about lower interest rates if stocks go down. We have an explicit put option. Now, in the, in the COVID crisis in the US, we replayed everything we did in 2008 on steroids and without apology. Uh, our Fed started buying up treasuries because it, it thought the prices were going too low. Our Fed issued a whatever it takes on corporate bonds. We will buy all the corporate bonds as necessary to keep corporate bond prices from going down. Now that that is an intervention. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, persuaded that, that fiddling with interest rates does much for asset prices. But when the Federal Reserve says we're going to buy up as much as needed to keep the prices of all corporate bonds from going down, as when the ECB says we're going to buy up whatever it takes of Italian debt to keep those prices from going down. Well, yeah, boom. That affects asset prices. That's that's a direct intervention. And, and offering a put option to asset prices, I think, is a is a is a terrible idea. And and that's there's huge moral hazard in what we just did. At least in 2008, we bailed out everybody or, or left and right and propped up all sorts of asset prices. But we had the decency to say, "Wow, there's some moral hazard here. People are not going to be keep, keep keeping cash around. They're going to leverage up. Let's pass this whole Dodd Frank business." It may have been ineffective, but at least we had the decency to try. This time, silence. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the biggest asset price bailouts of all time, uh, moral hazard up the wazoo, and no one's even in talking about it. The last comment, uh, regulate away dysfunction. If only we could regulate <laughs> away dysfunction in the markets and in the central banks. I'd be uh, passing, let's tomorrow, dis all dysfunction shall be banned. <laughs> I wish we could do that. And But, but seriously, uh, you know, Central banks are, are fond of pronouncing, oh, asset X is underpriced. Really? Who appointed you hedge fund? <laughs> uh, you know, there's also hedge funds out there trying to decide what's priced and underpriced. The central banks going out and saying, oh, I, I see dysfunction in the market. We're, we're going to buy this stuff. Uh, well, uh, taxpayer funded hedge fund that gets to print money to borrow interest free uh, overnight debt to hedge. That, 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 that's a, that's a, it, 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 Terrible idea. It, it's it's a it's assigning yourself a technocratic expertise that just isn't there. Thank you. Oh, we're getting very close to time. Um, there's a few questions that are still there that we wouldn't have had chance to to get to. Are there any sorry final final thoughts for a small country at the far end of the world facing open capital markets, floating exchange rates, uh, sea of global capital? that has a binding emissions trading scheme that covers not the not all emissions but the vast majority of gdp agriculture is yet coming in how should we be thinking about financial system responses to climate change within that context where we have an emissions trading scheme that's working uh futures prices are indicating that it's credible uh, ETS prices for carbon over the forward path are rising in line with expectations of a declining cap. Is there anything really here that a reserve bank should be looking closely at or should it be, uh, what would be some so part, parting thoughts for New Zealand? Are we entirely misguided or are we, what, what should we be well, thinking about here? Um, keep it simple and transparent, number one. Recognize as far as the world's climate is concerned, you know, I'm, I'm my city Palo Alto is determined to be net zero. Well, thank you. You know, that, that's going to change a thimble full of carbon. You, you're a small part of actual climate. But, but keeping your policies simple and transparent, I think, is the most important. Uh, I don't know enough about your trading scheme to comment, but these are fraught. Uh, the biggest issue no one's talking about now is there's lots of uh, promises to be net zero. What does net mean? Um, where, where, so in California, you get to call your, in our trading scheme, for example, you get credits if you have a forest that you promise not to cut down. Now, if you promise not to cut it down, then it's going to burn down. Uh, so that's not very helpful. And in fact, cutting it down, putting the wood into houses and then growing new wood would actually be a whole lot better for the climate. Uh, so um, just because you, what central planners discovered is, is it's awfully hard to count stuff. And I know for sure it's awfully hard to count how much carbon are you actually emitting. And it's even more fanciful to count how much carbon are you not emitting. So what is the net side of climate indulgences? I, I think a hearty look into that 
uh, would would be revealing. Uh, now, I, I don't know anything about, maybe New Zealand has managed to square this circle and, and uh, measure the unmeasurable, uh, which would be a miracle of bureaucracy, but um, well, I think that's the, the grand difficulty of it. But, but you're a small part of, of a large world. Uh, so, um, you know, keep it simple, keep it transparent and, and keep it green, which is easy in New Zealand because it's so beautiful. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, John. You've highlighted a lot of important issues for us. It worries me where we were pioneers in getting central bank independence, setting up strong structures for maintaining inflation within bounds, keeping it insulated from politics, but in a particular way where, okay, well, you still got parliamentary oversight. They set the targets that the Reserve Bank has to meet, but then the Reserve Bank full independence to just do what, what it takes to keep it within those bounds. And it kind of scares me that that independence could wind up being threatened in the place that invented it, basically, um, by adventurism into areas that really aren't part of the Reserve Bank's expertise or proper remit. So thank you. Uh, yes. Narrow narrow purpose institutions are good for yes. democracy. And we simultaneously have a climate change commission that's um, meant to be looking at those climate risks. So thank you so much, John. I hope that people here have been well, informed a little better on some of the risks that we might be facing and hopefully we can get things back on track without um, anything particularly bad happening along the way. So thank you so much, John. Thank you everyone for attending. Make sure to sign up for our newsletter so that you're informed about future webinars that we might be having and otherwise, Look forward to summer, summer holidays and your Christmas break in the winter over there. And hopefully someday you'll get to visit us again in person. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Goodbye, everyone.